Welcome to the Tokyo Alumni Podcast, episode 28. Today we have two guests, our first time to have two guests, uh, siblings. Um, Alyssa, we'll start with. Um, upon graduating from Princeton, Alyssa moved to Munich to work at a German advertising agency as a creative despite speaking zero German. With the exception of a work project in Abu Dhabi, she's lived in Europe ever since. After working at the agency, she moved to Stockholm to study digital design at Hyper Island in Stockholm. Several winners in Sweden prompted Alyssa to leave. She then moved to Basel, Switzerland, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, uh, to work for Clariant, a special, specialty chemicals company as their global social media lead. And we have the younger sister, Anna, graduate of uh, 2009 ASIJ, also graduate of Princeton. Um, at Princeton, Anna was interested in language and cultures and focused her studies around Mandarin and Brazilian Portuguese. After graduating in 2013, she started her career in advertising as an account manager at Agively and Mather, I'm not sure if I said that right, sorry, in New York, working on brands like SAP and Comcast. She then moved to Thailand, where she worked at TBWA Thailand as an account supervisor, leading their Myanmar accounts. In 2017, this opportunity led her to work in Singapore as associate account director at a different agency called BBH on the Nike account. In 2019, in a bit of a plot twist, she decided to pivot to the tech industry and move to Europe. She now works in sales and Umbabel, an AI translation startup based in Lisbon, Portugal. Welcome to the podcast. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks happy, for having us. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. So um, first time to have two guests, but we'll see how this goes. Huh? <laughs> So um, today, I think we're, we're going to really focus on the concept of culture, right? A lot of international schools are obviously, as our name indicate, international. I think like mm -hmm. when I graduated ASIJ in 2005, we must have had about 40 plus nationalities. Um, but you guys have an especially international background. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what your, your, how, how your mom and dad met, um, you know, what, what kind of language you guys learned growing up and how you guys ended up being to a certain degree quad quadlinguals would that be correct yeah partially <laughs> <laughs> um yeah maybe i can talk a little bit about how our parents met and then okay. we're going to how we were raised okay. so our parent my mom's our mom's thai from bangkok was really raised i would say in a, in a pretty thai manner she speak does speak english but definitely raised in a thai way from a kind of overseas chinese family and my dad, our dad is American with Swedish background from Seattle. How they met is really interesting. And when they met on the subway, I think the Chuo Sen um, in Tokyo, when they were both working there, my mom in advertising and my dad in banking, but both had studied during university time in Japan and speak fluent Japanese. So I think it was just interesting that, you know, through seeing each other on the subway every day, um, that's how they started dating and spending time with each other. My uh, mom actually thought my dad was a Mormon missionary at first, just because there weren't so many Caucasian men wearing a tie and everything. I think he also was carrying a novel, which my mom thought was definitely Bible. He was reading it all the time on the subway. <laughs> yeah, so that's how they met. And um, yeah, they, they had um, kids. Like, I think I was born in Japan, or no, in Thailand, but lived my first year in Japan. Then my other two siblings were born in Thailand, and we lived there for a while. Yeah. So they met, I would say, around university age. My dad did a university exchange um, at, from Princeton to Japan, so he met my mom there around that age. Um, I think Elisa, we were all born in Bangkok. We have a younger brother named Nathan. He's three years younger than me. Uh, we were all born in Bangkok and moved to Japan when I was five years old. I think, Elisa, you were eight, mm -hmm. eight or nine. And Nathan was only one or two years old when we, when we moved to Japan just for any job opportunity. I think for my parents, Japan was just the, the place that made sense for them. It was where they were going to call their home because that's the language that they spoke to one another. So when my dad was living in Japan, when we were all born there, it was probably a bit of a touch experience for him because we, our first language, our mother tongue was Thai and we were surrounded by dozens of Thai aunts and uncles. Um, and the language, of it, it was very dominant Thai culture, which is a very unique culture and quite exclusive, I would say. Um, right, if you don't speak Thai, no one's going to translate. <laughs> exactly, and also for my dad, his three kids just weren't really picking up any English. We weren't really going to school there yet, other than nursery. And so Japan made a lot more sense in terms of my parents both speak the language. Um, they both had new professional opportunities to embark on um, in the move to Tokyo. 
And so it was when we moved to Tokyo that <laughs> Nishimachi, Nishimachi. We, we all went through Nishimachi International School from kindergarten through all the way until the end, I would say eighth or ninth grade. And that's where we, I think English and Japanese was kind of simultaneously. Of course, English came more naturally to us because it was my dad speaks fluent English, always spoke English to us at home. But then when we were finally in international schooling system, that's when the English kind of became the dominant language. But we were also learning Japanese alongside. I, would, I think it was one hour of Japanese class every day, I think, at Nishimachi. Um, I think the interesting thing is that our parents always spoke Japanese to each other since they met. And since we moved to Japan, we started to understand their secret language. <laughs> and they realized that those secret language days are over. But as Anna said, yeah, my dad, our dad always spoke English to us and um, our mom, Thai. And then moving to Japan gave us this third language, um, which surprisingly, even though we heard it at home, since our parents didn't speak it to us, we, we are not, I wouldn't say we're, we're so fluent. We can, we can, we can converse. Yeah, we've heard it at home since we were young and still to this day, our parents speak Japanese to each other at home. So I'd say our understanding is quite good, but I think since we've left Tokyo now, I think over 10 plus years ago. It's difficult to keep up when you're not actually there. I guess it's a bit of a confusing story, but basically it's the three cultures of American, Thai, and Japanese, but we all grew up in Tokyo. So when you guys went to Tokyo, though, uh, by then, Alyssa, you're already about age eight. So I mean, quite a bit of you know, language development had, had already, you know, they say the sweet spot, I think, is something like age like four to six or something, right? What was the acquisition process like? Like when you landed to Japan, was, was it fast or did it take a while to, to catch up on Japanese or in that case, even English? I think uh, because we spoke English at home to our dad the whole time, um, English wasn't an issue. We also have so many relatives in the States. That wasn't a problem. But I think Japanese, I think we were primed for it because we've heard it at home, as mentioned. But, su but surprisingly, when you're not spoken to and expected to respond, your language acquisition is delayed. So I think I probably picked up Japanese faster than someone, you know, a family coming from the States that has never heard any Japanese. So I was still in the Nishimachi kind of like foreign language class, mm -hmm. but more like the middle. Like I remember at Nishimachi, they had a completely foreign language, native Japanese speakers, and then something in between. I think it was called yeah, JNN or something like that. Japanese so near native, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we were in. JNN, okay, I, yeah, that, that's really interesting. In ASIJ was a JNL, it's Japanese as a native language, and JF is Yeah, foreign. exactly. <laughs> Similar. Yeah. And also we were kind of immersed into all the activities around Japanese culture as well. We did Nihonbuyo, for example, and like yeah. abacus lessons. We were all about extracurricular activities that would help give us a boost in, I guess, cultural and language understanding. And when we moved, our parents also made a conscious decision to have us live in, not in the more expat areas, but we lived for many years in Shinanomachi, so not in like the Hiro or Bungi area, Motozabu area. And I think that actually also helped the, the Japanese but I think it was a slow, for me, it was, it was still a slow process. It wasn't like from one day to the next, I could speak it very well. Do you feel like um, I, a common question I get, you know, especially because because I, I speak two languages and I feel like I am one of the least helpful people to, to provide advice because I just was raised with two languages, right? I never really went through the process. You know, you, you, you've clearly gone through the process as well as, you know, uh, three languages as opposed to two. What would be um, an advice you would have towards households? And we see so many today, right? I'm always baffled when I come back to Japan, I turn the television on um, and I watch sports and there's always these more mixed kids like on TV and I'm just like, oh, there, there were never that many mixed kids when I was growing up. There, there was like one. maybe. <laughs> uh, but anyways, like in this climate now where there's just so much more international marriages, I think that's a big thing people think about. How do I teach my kid two, three languages? If you feel like there's anything your parents should, especially at home? Well, I would say it was probably helpful that my dad just owned English. Whenever he spoke to us, it was always English. Whenever my mom spoke to us, it was always Thai. So I think having that separation was really helpful to not be confused. Stuff to say about the Japanese that just kind of came in as a third language that was thrown into the mix. I think a lot of that was just through constant exposure. I think hearing and being here in Japanese, Japanese. yeah. But yeah, our parents never switched to speak Japanese to us at home. So, yeah. so to Anna's point, I think that one advice would be to be consistent. So what I hear from 
other multilingual families is like at some point the mom or the dad will kind of do what the children prefer, which is usually speak the school language that they speak with friends and then switch. So for instance, my mom could have caved and easily said, okay, I'll speak English with you guys. Yeah, I respond absolutely. in English. But she was really strict and only responding in Thai. And I think sometimes saying like she wouldn't respond to us if we didn't say something to Thai in Thai to her. Right. And so, our relatives were like, if you forget Thai, no one will talk to you when you come back to Thailand. So I think having that, just being strict about being strict language. consistent. I think the one parent, one language approach is one. I looked into it a little bit because I just gave birth uh, two and a half months ago to twins. And I'm in a situation where I live in Germany because my husband, in a small town, which is also new to me, there's like one street. <laughs> but it's really one street in the whole, the whole town. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's like a main street. There are more one re more residential streets, but there's one high street. <laughs> and um, okay, the point here is that there aren't that many international schools nearby. Even this town itself, not like, all German, not that many multilingual young Germans who can speak English. So my question is also, if I want to speak, somehow bring across Thai and English to my kids, whereas my husband will speak German, how can I do that? So how can you do the one parent, two languages thing? I thought of doing like starting them like morning to lunchtime Thai and then lunchtime to evening English because then my husband can understand. But I've switched to doing like one, like every other day, one language. I don't know. They're just two months old, so we'll see. I think in the end, it'll be hard to bring across two, especially because Thais were native, but we never studied, so it's not as strong as English. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have any advice yet for when you yeah. have more than one language for parent. I think that's mm -hmm. new territory for us. And one thing I heard from my parents was that I didn't really speak English until I was five or so, and I asked if that was ever a concern. Like, would I pick it up eventually? And they said they weren't worried at all because Thai is such a niche particular language that it's really just this opportunity to learn it. And they weren't worried about English, but I guess they already had in mind that we would go to English speaking schools. So that gave them the peace of mind that their English is going to come. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there's this thought process behind that let's teach them the language that might be harder to learn later, later knowing that like, in your case, if your kids will go through German schooling, that that will just come. Yeah, yeah that's really intriguing. How, how do you do it with the, with the three languages? And I, and I agree with what you guys have said about the, the one language, one parent. Um, I'm sure when you're in the States, you, you've probably met a lot of Asian Americans, and I, I met a lot of Japanese Americans. And one thing that baffled me was just the range of uh, linguistic ability. There were some Japanese people that quite frankly spoke better Japanese than me, even though they've never lived in Japan. And then there were people that spoke none and it seemed to simply come down to whether or not, it was usually the mother, but you know, whether or not their mother had, had spoken mm -hmm. Japanese to them. And I think, and I also hear examples, like you said, if you have, let's say a mixed family living in, let's say half Japanese, half American living in the US where they're going to English speaking school, then the parent trying to speak Japanese, it just becomes much harder. I think the children when they're young want to speak what their friends speak. It's the cool thing. So what I've heard is like it's even more challenging when you're the minority language. That's true. And especially because the parents want their kids to be able to fit in seamlessly. So it's like, okay, if their friends want them to do this, I just go with the flow. It'd rather not yeah, not disrupt, I guess, the yeah. friendships that might be formed. So that that's tough. It's a tough choice as a parent, right? Do you want your kids to fit in or do you want them to learn the language? <laughs> right. <laughs> forever. <laughs> true. So uh, the last point I want to uh, uh, just briefly touch upon while we're on the subject of language. So again, I think something unique to mixed families, I see it in my own family, I have two younger brothers, is is there a difference um, with linguistic ability within the three siblings, right? There's actually one more sibling who's not here today. And I know you guys are up there, <laughs> but he might be watching. <laughs> Yeah, I would say Elisa's Thai is probably better than the two of us. Maybe that's changed a little bit because I actually went back and worked in Thailand for almost two years. But that's where I felt like my Thai really accelerated. Mm -hmm. But in general, it, had I not done that, I, Nathan and I, our Thai reading and writing is not very good. And each time we decide to improve, it always takes a very conscious effort to try to study the Thai alphabet. But I think not knowing where it can come in handy kind of stunts the <laughs> motivation a little bit. Um, I would say your time is, is definitely better than ours. She lived in Thailand for longer. Exactly, because I lived there when I, till I was eight, and I did actually start going to international school mm -hmm. like the last year before we left, I think, Thailand. And I did have Thai classes, part of that schooling system. And that's why I naturally announced that till recently. Um, 
spoke better Thai. What, what my mom also says helps is that, for instance, even though Nathan only spent, I don't know, two, three years in Japan? Yeah, I mean, even, Thailand, even less. What helps is when there are older siblings who are strong in that language, who kind of keep that language going at home. Like we would speak Thai around my mom and to our younger siblings. Um, That's a great point. So you could almost say the reverse could be an issue too. If you have an older sibling who's like, I don't want to learn this language, then it would, it would exactly. see younger siblings. It's completely influence, yeah, the, yeah. the vibe at home. But at least I'm not, you know, showing an interest in keeping up her Thai. Yeah. It's probably all anchored around my mom. Like yeah. she, just, she really pioneered this um, Thai speaking at home. But if Elisa didn't have an interest, then mm -hmm. I think it would be very tough for Nathan and I too. Yeah. feel inspired to continue to speak it yeah and i think it helps being there for the first years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. japanese wise i don't know different it's i think it's different context nathan played baseball he went to Hoi Kuen. yeah he went to Hoi Kuen and he <laughs> played on a japanese baseball team he did asij baseball as well but on top of that played on a japanese team but that's a totally different set of vocabulary that you'd learn on the baseball field versus in a, a jnn class um so i think it's yeah kind of what we made of it over time, it's hard to say who's, it's really tough, who's yeah. better or, or worse in Japanese. Mm -hmm. But there's also the natural, there's another natural aspect, which is like language affinity. Within siblings, there are also just some who are more interested, more motivated, like Anna said. So I think that'll naturally create some differences. It's like, how do you feel about within your family? I'm, I'm not used to answering questions, um, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, in my family, three boys, and yeah, the reason I ask is, is this, uh, in our, we're, we're, uh, we're, we only speak two languages, and even within um, our family, I'm actually happy you mentioned the Hoikuen, so Japanese uh, pre-K, um, you know, two, two brothers went to uh, Japanese kindergarten, Yochien, uh, one didn't, I was the one who didn't, I think one went to Hoikuen, so one went to pre-K, the other two didn't, uh, and then today, in 2020, there's just a big range where, um, one of us uh, speaks pretty good Japanese, writes pretty good Japanese. One is also decent, and one doesn't speak much. <laughs> so, <laughs> who's who? But one of us. <laughs> yeah, so there's a decent range um, within even our family. So um, it was interesting when you mentioned the the schooling. I guess it's not much advice, but that's what I tend to tell my friends who have you know multicultural kids, and they're like, "Oh, do I send them the?" Hoikuen or Yochen or you know international school and I just tend to tell them like if you know your kids work hard it kind of works out <laughs> like, like I've seen people you know go to Japanese school to grade five and still have pretty bad Japanese and I know people who are at ASIJ their whole life and have really good mm -hmm. Japanese it seems to That's be true. a such a big range I think yes. later in life it depends on your natural interest as well because that's going to take you the furthest um, if you see a future in Japan if you or, you know, if you love the language, then that's really going to propel you. Yeah. And then also, as mentioned, like, since we knew we would enter the US, um, English speaking system, it could help, like you say, it's not always um, so easy to predict, but it could help to put them in daycare or the nursery in the other language. So for instance, I would consider, do I, do I finance them going to some kind of international school for the first few years? Because I know they'll end up in the German system later. Mm -hmm. Kind of just solidify, because you mentioned those magical years, like those age four to six. So I want to switch gears a bit to, we're keeping with this international theme, and this is a, maybe a, a bit more in Anna's domain, but um, you know, nowadays people live everywhere, right? Even with this Tokyo Alumni podcast, we've got people from Chile to South Africa, obviously Germany today. How has the professional experience, and I know this also relates to you, um, Alyssa, been different from location to location? And has there been any like big surprises where you were like, whoa, this place is a great place, you know, <laughs> you want, you know, multicultural experiences, et cetera. Uh, and have, you know, there been places where you've been maybe a bit underwhelmed? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, well, we're just speaking about language affinity and natural curiosity, and I, I took that into my college years. So I decided to learn Brazilian Portuguese and Mandarin Chinese. I kind of thought that college was going to be my last opportunity to learn these languages in a you know, disciplined, serious way. So I thought, okay, I'd learn these two. And I ended up um, going to Brazil for a nine month study abroad program. I also spent four months in China. So I think it was during university, I was learning all these languages. And I think rather than just having a vacation or you know, a study abroad party experience in these countries, I thought, I'm going to make the most of it and I'll try an internship in these countries and I'll see what it's like to live and work there. 
So it kind of started there that my mind opened up to, okay, I could, I could live and work anywhere. It seems like I, I think the world is a smaller place than ever. I found an internship pretty easily in Brazil and I thought, okay, maybe I'll move there after university. So I think my mind, my thought process was just, okay, it seems like whatever path I want to forge, um, I definitely want to live abroad at some point because it, it's just so culturally enriching. I started my career, as you mentioned, the bio in New York, which was a lot of fun um, because we went to Princeton, which is an hour and a half uh, train ride away. So it felt like all of my university peers were there. And on top of that, there were so many ASIJ people there. It was like a crew of, you know, ASIJ. Um, usually people will go to school in the U.S. afterwards and New York just attracted. I think I had a crew of like 50 ASIJ people living there when I was there. Very world colliding, very fun um, kind of place. And I, I think I could have just continued living in New York. But um, out of an interest of working on brands outside of the US, so I, I started my career in advertising. And I think my interest in working in advertising was around the fact that different brands and products message themselves in such different ways across territories. And there is a cultural aspect to that in advertising. And working in New York for two years, I thought, okay, I was working on only the U.S. domestic market, and that's when I decided to make to move over to to Bangkok just to work on more local brand and to kind of reconnect with my roots a little bit in some way. And work-wise, I mean, the cultural differences between the U.S. and Asia are huge. I would say one of them is kind of the level of hierarchy and respect that's expected of you. I would say that in New York, as a young maybe junior person in advertising. You're encouraged to raise your hand. You're encouraged to speak up in meetings. You're encouraged to ask questions. This is how you show your engagement. However, I remember this one story when I was in Bangkok. My first, it was a briefing meeting where my boss was kind of briefing the entire team on a new campaign. And me and my New York mindset was like, okay, I have some questions. I'm going to ask them, kind of not just to show that I was eager, but that was part of it, just to be engaged. And so I asked her some questions at the end of this briefing session. She answered them in kind of a succinct, very short way. And then after that, the next three days, she proceeded to not really speak to me or she was acting very strange around the office. And so I was like, what's up? I actually had to pull her aside and say, sorry if I'm noticing something that you're not, but did, did I say something? Like something seems to be off. And I guess she, it came out that she perceived that I was questioning, like I was questioning her, her briefing in a, in a negative way. And I guess, she lost faith during that briefing, which I think knowing Japan, cult Japanese culture, this is probably a thing in Japan as well. But me just having come from New York, I was just very taken aback by this. Mm -hmm. and in the end, everything was fine. But I, in New York, I thought I was always seen as someone who was very respectful, very polite, very humble. I thought I had all of these kind of Asian upbringing attributes in me. But then in moving to Thailand, I was like this aggressive, kind of abrasive person who just moved from New York. And that was very, very surprising. But of course, it was it was on me to adapt, right? I wasn't going to keep carrying on that way. So I would say that, that was one of the biggest, the biggest shocks. There's also a really strong sense of community living in Asia as well. This is professionally and non-professionally is that um, people kind of look out for another. People are actually friends with all of their colleagues. I felt like in the U.S. at 5 p.m., if you didn't have like the once a month happy hour plan that was pre-scheduled, you wouldn't just hang out at the office all night. I felt like in Thailand, it was very much a sense of camaraderie and friendship amongst each other and not really a competitive feel anyway. So that sense of community was really nice as well. I would say also in Europe, there's like a little more hierarchy and, and questioning about um, overstating your, your area a little bit in Europe, but I think more so than in the US. I had worked in Asia recently, but I would say Europe is something in between. Work-life balance, I think, is, is really more valued here than that's one thing that's definitely um, come across more valued here than let's say in Asia or even the US. Yeah, um, I want to get back to work life balance in a moment. One question I would have about Bangkok as well as Singapore is so you're in New York. Um, obviously, you know, gender disparity is still an issue in the States. But I think at the same time, people don't give the United States enough credit. You know, even though what something like five of the 500 SNP companies have women CEOs, which is very underwhelming. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, the US is still quite ahead when it comes to women in the workplace. Um, to uh, in regards to you say kind of the cultural aspect. Obviously, they're right behind when it comes to maternity leave. Well, now Alyssa, you you could probably second me <laughs> with that. Um, but um, 
going back to yeah so that culture did you feel like uh gender wise it was a very different feeling in in bangkok singapore in comparison to new york that's interesting in singapore i worked at a very international agency there were a few americans there were a few people from europe so it was kind of it was a mix and i think my team was inter- in, international enough that i didn't really feel gender disparity however i was working on um the nike account which is quite a boys club if you can imagine in terms of the, the, just the people that would work at that company and the kind of brand that they that they generally are. I think they're trying to change that. They have a lot of women initiatives as a brand. So they're trying to push that from the agency side as well. In Bangkok, I could kind of feel that disparity around. I think there was a, they weren't really encouraging women to speak up and women were kind of just there to execute and do as opposed to lead and be the strategic thinker there. I could sense that. However, I was one of the few native English speakers at my Bangkok agency. So I felt that I did get quite a bit of responsibility. So I didn't feel like I was, you know, more junior than I should have been in terms of treatment or anything like that. Going back to the work-life balance So you guys are both now in Europe, right? Germany and and Portugal. What has been your experience basically, you know, having gone to university in the States and then I'm assuming a lot of your friends now work in the States. How how do you, at least in the examples of Portugal and Germany, do you see firsthand? I think the first really easy example is just number of holiday days in a standard contract. It's like anything from 25 to 35. I work in Switzerland, but here I live in Germany and that also applies there. So I think that's already one. And I think culturally people, people are encouraged to take their holidays. Whereas I feel like also having not worked apart from interning in the States, but from what my sister says, it's you kind of feel guilty depending on what your company, what your company culture is taking holidays. Whereas in Europe, it's like, no, please take them all. It's like, it's almost a kind of worker protection that you're, you're, you're required to take them. At my current company, it's also, you know, depending on certain rules, they even look at how many hours you work and, and, you know, if you work too much overtime, then you're required to take holidays. So they really protect you from from overwork um, in that sense. And I think you, no one feels guilty going on holiday or saying they need some time off. Yeah. The number of holidays here in Germany is like 20, 25 to 35, 25. depending on. In Portugal, it's 22 as well, whereas I think standard in the U.S. and Asia are 10. In the U.S., I guess some companies will have Christmas break kind of built in. So that's maybe five extra days, but it has to be taken over Christmas. So yeah, I just remember my feeling in the U.S. was just being able to kind of guiltily ask for a day or two off at a time. I wouldn't really dream of asking for a full week off, um, whereas here that seems to be the norm. And that's really the only way to fully switch off. Yeah, and another example is just, for instance, maternity leave. It's a year, even up to three years, partially paid, but more like holding your position, which is amazing. I work in Switzerland, so according to Swiss law, I would get, for instance, the standard four months, but that's still much longer than what's offered in the US. Um, And I used to study in Sweden, where I obviously didn't have kids, but there it's it's even better, for instance, that for the many years after giving birth, you can leave work early, daycare is affordable and, and easy to find. So I think they really try to integrate your family into, into a, do work life balance yeah i think in general they're not really keeping track of oh are you leaving before your boss does there's not really that sense of the culture where are you, yeah. where are you going why would you even think about leaving right now at 6 p.m yeah you just need um, to finish your work yeah. um and then now with, with obviously covid 19 it also changes in terms of remote work even the most traditional companies that i've seen in let's say germany or switzerland obviously there's there's no choice they have to allow remote work um and i think they're now learning that it is It does work. They don't have the excuse anymore of like, even if face-to-face has benefits. But I think that's also changing the fluidity of where you can work and when. Mm -hmm. And what employees actually want, which is the trust and flexibility. So on the flip side then, what are some things living in Europe where you've been kind of like, well, I miss, you know, this about Asia or this about the U.S.? Other than the food. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's definitely many non There's categories. Yeah, exactly. Right? There's big categories. Um, and, and maybe um, friendliness. Like my sister and I were talking about the fact that here, a lot of, in Europe, a lot of people associate Americans as friendly, but a little bit fake. As in, hey, how are you? But I'm not going to listen to what you really respond. Yeah. Like, hey, how are you? Walk past. <laughs> and, you know, we should grab a drink together, but not ask for your number. So there's like a little bit of, this is again generalizing hugely. <laughs> Um, whereas in Europe, 
even if some people don't, they're not so openly friendly or maybe there's a language barrier. I feel like once you earn their friendship, they really are. They're like, let's grab a drink. They really propose a date and a time and they want it to happen. <laughs> um, you kind of earn their friendship. I'm only one year into my time in Portugal, and I feel like the vibe in Portugal is probably quite different from Germany. But in general, people are quite reserved, in, I would say. So what Elisa says applies in that sense where once you earn their friendship, you do actually earn their friendship. But I think when moving to Portugal and I saw just the different nationalities living there, I was like, oh, there's people from Spain and France and the UK. Like, this is international. It's going to be great. And then I arrived and I was like, oh, but they're actually all EU. And so their, you know, their mindset and the way they brought up has a lot more overlaps and similarities than someone who's half Asian, half American. So I think just relatability with people has sometimes been a little bit difficult. You know, you'll talk about this, your time living abroad and cultural differences in a discussion like this, for example, um, it would be very foreign to some of them, which is, which is not a bad thing. I think it's, it was just different for me because I moved from big city to big city to big city and previous my previous experience was Singapore, which is incredibly diverse. Um, yeah, and I think maybe not only, you know, cultural differences depending on where you live and where other people are from, but also relatability to, since all of us, including you, kind of grew up in international school, obviously wherever you go in the world, when you meet somebody who has this similar multicultural background, then you just relate better to them. And it's hard to pinpoint where they're from, but as long as they're a mix, then mm -hmm. you But even if there's kind of a more it's more authentic the friendliness here i do i did sometimes kind of miss that upbeat like hey how are you doing really like your shoes even if they don't call me later i'm like i kind of miss having right. this warmth around me or maybe it's just more talkative yeah average, I would say. yeah more yeah that's true yeah I, I've, I've experienced that firsthand too i hadn't been to the states about a year and then um i was just waiting for an elevator and then some person was like hey and i just remember that was like reverse culture shock i was like i don't know this person and i just said hi <laughs> Yeah, you've been in Korea, so Korea is also. Yeah, Korea, so like, uh, it was, um, it, yeah, it was refreshing. It was refreshing. I kind of felt a little bit comfortable. I felt kind of, uh, yeah, I, yeah, that's really interesting. So, um, as we sort of wrap up culture as well as language, you were talking um, off air about certain words that you felt like represented certain cultures. So, you like to share those words with us? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting when certain words don't directly translate into others because it really reflects what the values of that that certain culture. So one of our favorite words we discussed uh, in Thai is kling dai. And kling dai means to kind of not want to impose. So again, if you translate to English, it's, it's so many words together. In Thai, it's one word. You don't want to impose on somebody. So when someone's like, um, I can give you a lift tomorrow to the event we're going to. The other person could be like, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. but they could, they'll actually say it instead of just express that they are going to they'll actually say, I'm going to die. They'll be like, oh, I don't want to impose. Yeah. And it's um, kind of like, a, a, like, you feel bad. Yeah. The connotation is kind of guilt. And I, and I, we do see that. Like if you invite guests into your home, depending on where they're from, again, generalizing, some are more open to mm -hmm. just like making themselves at home, <laughs> which is not a bad thing. But in Thailand, it's definitely more, they're definitely more on pins and needles. Yeah. And again, when people say this, it's kind of firm. It's not really like a, oh, I'm just saying that I feel bad so that you can say it again. And I'll, you know, it's like, no, I am going Thai. So, so no, yeah. thank you. <laughs> That's kind of the, the yeah. vibe, which is interesting. Whereas in the US, you get some of this like, oh, no, like you must be busy. But then so after just... a little bit of back and forth, it'll happen. They'll be like, thanks, that would be great. Yeah, thanks, cold 9 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> They're like, can you actually come to my other, like, directly to my door? As well? <laughs> yeah. And then the word in Japanese, again, not being native, completely native in Japanese, we love otsukare-sama. Um, <laughs> it's also hard to translate when people ask us. We're like, it means Mr. Tired. Literally, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Tired. Literally. But more like... Yeah, like, okay, we had a long day. No, we're all tired. <laughs> no other language that we know of um, addresses this, but it's like sense of community, like you mentioned, and also like yeah. being thankful for other people being tired with you. And you're sharing in this feeling together, even though, yeah, if Nathan took his medical exams, he'd be like, let's go to Tanisha, and he would, as if we kind of share in his efforts, even though we didn't at all. I just thought of a German one, which is, I don't want to say it reflects German culture because that would be a little mean, but I always thought it was interesting that they have such a mean word. And the word is Schadenfreude, 
which means feeling happy when someone else feels pain, which is horrible. <laughs> if, if, if like someone you know doesn't get the job or something, and then you're like, oh, I feel schadenfreude. It's like this shameful feeling of being happy when someone else suffers, which is horrible again. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to say that that means that Germans are all mean, but it's interesting that that word exists, um, which we can't really translate. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or for something, maybe it's a bit more lighthearted. Like shot, shot. Yeah, it is. It's like slipped on a banana peel. Ha ha. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Wait, so that was I, uh, Japanese, uh, German. Oh, no, and the only other language is English, but I don't know if there's anything that specific to English. It's hard to yeah. we English is our main language, so I'm just thinking, like, what would it be interesting to someone else? Hmm. Oh. What I noticed was. <laughs> I'll Google it and I'll put in I'll put it in the link, whatever word I discover. What what I think is what I think is interesting though, for instance, in German, they just have many more words than the English language. So whenever they ask, like, how do you translate this word? I'll end up giving them a sentence. And they're like, no, 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 but we want a word. So I think in general, um, with English, you you feel like you explain things more than having like a concise word, which no maybe words. in Japan would Japanese would exist or in, especially in German. That's true. In the U.S., everything is hyperbolized. So you can come away from like a mediocre weekend with your friends. And when asked how it was, you'll be like, that was amazing. Best weekend ever. And no one really thinks twice. So I guess she had a good weekend. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. I think Here they take it literally. If you have uh, the, had the best day of your life, they're like, wow, you lived through many weekends. <laughs> yeah. I thought about that. The hyperbo hy hyperbolizing of American talk. Yeah. That's right. That's true, though. I, I do hear that a lot. People <laughs> say the best restaurant, you know, ever. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And like amazing is it has been standardized into being. And I think we, we've good. been called out a lot on that because we are like my husband's German and her boyfriend is French right now. And it's just they definitely uh, tell us when we're yeah, you thought really hyperbolizing. <laughs> so, um, at the end here, I like to wrap it up with just sort of asking people what's coming up in the next few years, next few decades, maybe. Um, I don't know if anyone's thought that far. Maybe you have. I haven't. Yeah. So um, it will, I guess, go in a uh, very Asian here. We'll go with the older one first. <laughs> Let's start with Alyssa. <laughs> um, I think so. As mentioned, I have two almost three month old twins right at home right now. And I feel like I don't know what's coming next, but I definitely know that a lot of them are going to go into raising them, which I also look forward to. And I think we will be staying here for a while in Germany in case anybody comes to Waldshut, little German Inaka village near Zurich on the border. So yeah, raising kids, trying to teach them German, and, I mean, English and Thai from my side. And career-wise, I'm not sure, we'll see. I think at some point it's interesting to, to try to do something on your own maybe, especially if you have kids who start thinking mm -hmm. flexibility, but I also enjoy my current company, so. Yeah. And turn you leave is until? December. Yeah, I think, yeah. So we'll see. But yeah, definitely twins is my main focus right now. And Anna? On my side, I started a new job in January. So it's only been a little over six months. I'm working in AI, in tech, for in translations, actually. So it's related to language as well, which I really enjoy. Um, and that's based in Portugal, which is new for both my boyfriend and I. It's mentioned he's French. Um, so we've just kind of embarked on this new adventure together. Job-wise, it's going well. I'm now in, in sales, but it's, it's software sales. It's very different. It's different from kind of selling ideas, which is what I was doing in advertising. Um, there's a lot of things I enjoy about it. I think I still have a lot to learn. So the plan is to just keep doing what I'm doing and see how things go. I think a year is, is a bit too short to figure out how we feel about a specific place or a specific chapter, but so far so good. And Portugal is a beautiful place. We've been going to the beach a lot, um, surfing pretty often as well, which is nice. So yeah, enjoying the life and just seeing, seeing where it might take us, but for now in Portugal. Wow, it's super international. And this is actually a bit unorthodox, but since we have gone through uh, Alyssa and Anna, do we want to just throw in what Nathan is up to in case someone? <laughs> so we sure, cover he's, all he's, all he's, he's actually the only one in the U.S. because they're both in Europe now. But we used to have obviously Anna in Asia, me in Europe, and Nathan <laughs> in the U.S. So at least we're on one continent. It makes it easier for our parents. And Nathan is currently he's at NYU Medical School, starting a three-year orthopedic surgeon. 
surgery program there right now. Yeah. He finished his first year, so now he's doing a summer internship. Yeah, he's on a fast track um, to be an orthopedic surgeon. Very different from our career path so far. Yeah, we're a little bit more focused, but we're super excited for Nathan and yeah. proud of him. Hands the Shout out to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, all three of the Lorenzes and um, yeah, thank you for joining um, us today all the way from Germany. Good luck with everything. And I usually say like our paths might cross, but I, I with COVID and I've never been to Portugal in my life and I've never been to Switzerland in my life. So and maybe Thailand, or maybe Thailand, somehow, somehow the paths cross. Thailand, cross before, so we'll see. But if ever in Europe, let us know. Thailand would Probably. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. This was actually really fun and it was nice to catch up with you as well. Yeah. Let's go.